We are live. Okay. Zero Perfect. Books Basement, and we're here to discuss Chapter 13 of Capital Volume 1 on cooperation. Uh, so what did you guys uh, what did you guys think of the chapter? Any thoughts? Hmm. Well, I thought it was uh, much more simpler than the past chapters we've been discussing. I also thought that it got very into the particulars that go into factory work and manufacture. And I also very, very much liked how it uh, drew a very clear line between what an actual capitalist and mm -hmm. the economic kind of relations that come before you actually become a full-fledged capitalist. Okay. And what about you, Elliot? Any thoughts about the? Well, yeah, topic? it's a very important chapter, especially for um, um, the anarchy, socialism, communism uh, yeah. discussion in terms of mm -hmm. authority being necessary and inescapable. Um, once you go through that qualitative shift of, and, and that's why I put this as the background of when you have a factory with this, that requires a certain amount of laborers, um, and yeah. you can produce a product that can no longer be simply produced by one person. Um, you you sort of you are either on the side of authority or technology or essentially like anarcho primitivist. I think it's okay. a good. I think I, I, it's like a subtle redemption for uh, anarcho primitivism. I think as the most logically sound anarchism, right? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> In an interesting way. point. So I just want to <laughs> outline maybe the essential thrust of the argument here, um, and there are a lot of little details, but for people who maybe you haven't read the chapter, which I assume could be potentially many of the people watching, you idiots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, come on guys, get it together. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, I think like the basic idea here, so Marx outlines you know, certain aspects of, of the uh, social cooperation as it pertains to the labor process. Um, and uh, his essential argument pertains to the way that um, incidentally, in the development in the earlier stages of the reproduction of capital and value, you might have had situations where, um, you know, a capitalist, let's say, I hesitate to even use the word capitalist if we're talking about, say, for example, like um, social formations that precede manufacturing, but someone could pay other people for their labor, right? Um, and then, you know, perhaps incidentally, they could amass like a certain uh, accretion, right, of laborers as a consequence of that. But one of the crucial things that Marx delineates here uh, is the way that in the capitalist mode of production, which he states is, you know, not necessarily clearly differentiable from the stage of manufacture, right? Like the, the, that it's a, a vague kind of demarcation, um, that the actual requirements of um, operating uh, the constant capital or the, the, the machines and the factories, uh, which are uh, necessary to maintaining the economy, uh, require the amassing of a large number of laborers in one spot, right? So in that way, uh, the principle of social cooperation is strengthened, right, in that context. And Marx, Marx sees this as fundamentally contradictory because on one hand, you have people uh, who are amassed, like workers who are amassed in this context, but on the other hand, they're also atomized in the wage relation. So you don't, it's not like you're paying like, you know, the whole, uh, you know, mass of workers collectively, right? You're paying each individual for their labor power. Right, and they become socially instantiated um, as you know, as a kind of individual in that way. But at the same time, there's a contradictory tension, um, which is the uh, you know, I guess, potential consciousness, um, you know, an organization uh, that can arise through the social cooperative principle uh, as it manifests uh, in the uh, the requirements, right, of heightened, uh, higher organic. Uh, composition of capital, so more constant capital, more factories, and so on. Right? Uh, does that does that do you guys follow? Does that kind of make sense? Everyone yeah. follow? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's 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 the basic structure of it. And so I think when Elliot's saying it's like a redemption of anarcho primitivism, um, as logically sound, not as a good <laughs> idea, but in terms of <laughs> okay, like okay, okay. anarcho technology, how do you have technology like anarcho transhumanism, whatever, you know? <laughs> I don't know, or well, no, any I mean, any other an, um, I don't anarcho trans. Know. So what? What do you mean, anarcho transhumanism? I'm just curious what you're getting at. <laughs> See, I don't even know. <laughs> I think it's not a very thought out ideology aside from futurism. I think it's just the futurist tendency for DIY technological uh, 
improvements, but you're, of course, ignoring the fact that there's a means of production and to what extent is there any actual anarchy happening because you would need the state and its apparatus, right, to produce the technology um, typically. Um, maybe, but let, yeah, like a silicone chip or something like that or even a biohacking tool. Mm. I would, you know, you can't, uh, you can't simply ignore the way those are produced, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that's like a common, I think a common notion today that proliferates is, I mean, certainly Marx, I think, understood, and even though it was less important than in the 20th century, I think he understood, um, you know, the essentiality of, let's say, governments to this process, right? That, that That's articulated by him at different times. Um, but, you know, we can see, like, as industrialization even further intensifies and globalizes in the 20th century, that governments become, uh, you know, and as the organic composition of capital changes, governments become even more important than they were in Marx's era, right, to the reproduction of capital. So I think, I think one of the, uh, one of the, and I'm going to say ideological notions of our time is the idea that, you know, and of course, there's been a, um, a regression from this kind of extensive government intervention in the economy in the West you know, as a percentage of spending of GDP over the past few decades. I think one of the one of the big ideological notions of our time is the idea that uh, like private capital, and you were talking about technology, that it could actually create these things without any kind of government regime, right? Like that, that the kind of constant capital necessary to uh, enrichment uh, or that social cooperation would be predicated upon could be created uh, by private capital entirely. But, and, and I think a good, example of this is like sorry I'm, I'm getting a bit out there but i think a good example of this is like how you know there's a certain kind of fiction it's like the internet was would never have existed without government you know it comes very straightforwardly from government investment yeah, yeah. right like yeah, that's a straight line um and you know i think a good good expression of this ideologically is the way like you know you kind of get this like anarcho bitcoin stuff you know where people are like oh yeah we can just like replace all the faculties of centralized banking right through the use of like bitcoin and it's like, yeah, well, let's talk about the problem of of um, of scaling, right? For that, it's like, you know, Bitcoin, like they can't even, you know, maintain anything like a stable value, right? So it's like, what if you're running, like if it's a general currency, okay, you're running a, a grocery store and you're running around every 20 seconds having to readjust all the prices on everything, right? And then you start to realize why, right? These kind of centralized apparatuses exist, right? If we're talking about reserve banks and things like that. But I think I think the same metaphor can be can be applied to technology. It's like, it's not private capital, you know, that's actually producing the biggest technological breakthroughs. It's actually investments that are mostly emanating, of, emanating out of military research, right? So like an iPhone, 85% of the parts in an iPhone can be traced to US military research. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, so I wanted to just about the anarcho technologism. That was what I was referring to, Elliot. Yeah. Um, because it's like how, to what extent does that technology really attest to or enable um a bona fide decentralization say that one more time sorry to what to what extent does this these could do these kind of new new technologies really attest to or make possible uh a bona fide process of decentralization you know they i you can't i don't i don't think it it's almost a non-sec like it, it almost it's just so categorically um Different. I mean, I suppose you could, you could argue that technology can make possible these new worlds that we that we don't have before, especially like communication technology. Yeah. But ultimately, it has to go back to, um, you know, capital and the production of uh, commodities and the goods, uh, and, and technologies. You can't really escape that. You can't sort of um, individualize those, especially with the the necessary processes for creating these sort of higher level um, technologies like uh, silicon chips and things like that. You can't sort of, you know, you can't home homebrew any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but but to go back to like uh, just the, the very sort of simple idea in the chapter, I think is, that's very important, which is, I think there's a tendency, especially in unionizing or something like that, uh, to have this sort of r radical sort of anarchist um, um, idea that there is no eventual consensus that is sort of attended attended to, or it's or that uh, consensus is rather can be sort of 
uh, resolutely rejected for one's own um, ego, wait, ego book, for one's own <laughs> unique. There it is. The ego and you, you mean uh, consensus between authority and the subject? Yeah, to a certain extent, it, it's true, but um, to a larger extent, um, we have to participate in groups in order to have um, sort of larger or, or different categorical sort of items, right? For instance, you could even say like this reading group is a categorical item that you can't have uh, without a group. So we, you know, when we discuss, it's even in this very small scale, when we discuss how we're going to stream it, uh, where we're going, where we're going to stream it, um, things like that, um, eventually an idea or singular consensus and authority is sort of given to that idea. And what Sterner talks about is like, oh, the union of egoists. And, you know, as soon as the contract becomes um, not beneficial for yourself, then the true anarchist in his self-interest will then remove himself from the contract. But you, it's not that easy because, um, for instance, say like a publishing company, right? Mm -hmm. Zero books. Um, it's, you know, you, you can't simply every single time you have a disagreement, remove yourself from the entire structure or, yeah. or system, right? Because um, there's a qualitative shift that happens with, um, with a say a publishing company, especially with the factory, um, or you know anything like that. So I think um, this the, the the emphasis of freedom and individual will in the American sort of um, ideology and Western ideology in general is really missing this point um, of, that Marx makes. Um, there, there's a few times in when you read philosophy that um, you hear something and you're like, well, people really have to understand that. Um, and I think this is it for Marx, right? People really, really, really have to understand this because um, it's extraordinarily important and the implications mm. are so vast um, with one's general tendency to sort of reject all authority against the individual will. And what Hegel talks about in the philosophy of right is the state's ultimate responsibility is to act against the individual will, right? Um, but Marx sort of turns turns or he expands that rather and I, I think a much more profound way where stay hey stay I, I don't know as a Freudian I'm like what does that one mean uh, <laughs> but uh, as a uh, Hegel says okay the state and God and blah 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 but mm. it's nothing but what Marx is really like I would say light years ahead of Hegel here in terms of the role of authority and why why we need authority uh, within modernity, right? Which Hegel doesn't talk much about, um, which is the state of, and you know, it wasn't necessarily his his time so much. A bit though. Um, yeah, a bit though with the factories. I don't know. But yeah, it's an extraordinarily important point that you can't simply exit systems in the name of freedom, that you do have to participate in structures to get this qualitative product whatever that product is and that that and then two that that structure should be organized in the way you could say most beneficial for you but is less alienated from the labor and a laborer and less prone to despotism um in terms of the capitalist simply just yeah. mm -hmm. you know uh, exploiting laborers further and further and further because they have this because they have to participate once again there's that have to they have to participate in that in that structure they can't simply exit the structure so this whole notion of freedom um totally misses this point of marx like if there is one chapter this might even be like the one chapter i would like tell people to go through in terms of like especially um if you have an anarchist friend recommend them chapter 13 <laughs> of um you know and i'm very sympathetic towards anarchist tendencies um Contra, I, I would say, contra, like trying to work around the government, um, but, mm. but, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, but there's a limit, and you see that within anarchist groups, they're very DIY, mm. right? Why are anarchist groups DIY? Why don't they have large um, structures? And that's because you simply cannot have this qualitative increase 
when you don't have authority, right? Scorn, well, scorn, yeah, really important. I think I think one of the things here we got to say uh, is that first of all, I just want to make a note about the United States. I mean, it's often joked that you know there are no poor in America; they're only temporarily not millionaires, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that actually, if you look at the foundation of the United States, you have this. Uh, historical tension, right, that you find in the French Revolution as well between republicanism and, and liberalism. Um, you know, whereas we can say, too schematically really, but we can say that, um, you know, in republicanism, there's more of a stress on positive freedom, right, that we find in, you know, Machiavelli and Rousseau, et cetera. Um, and in liberalism, there's more of a stress on negative freedom, right? Um, and I think that one thing you see in the United States is that the liberal stress on negative freedom was foregrounded in the foundation of the country because of its particular class composition. So in other words, like, you know, if you look at the conditions that originally uh, were associated with voting in the United States, you know, in terms of the kind of, you know, property ownership and the kind of social case you had to come from, it skewed strongly in such a way that the kind of democratic body that they were assembling was able to foreground, uh, you know, the significance of, of negative freedom um, because these were basically, you know, it was catering to a certain bourgeois. Right. Who yeah. and maybe they weren't bourgeois before, but they'd become bourgeois when they came to America because there was so much open land, indigenous land, really. They were able to easily appropriate it and then transform themselves right into owners of the means of production. Mm -hmm. Right. But then, like, you know, that that focus on negative freedom already presupposed in a certain sense, like the total disenfranchisement of slaves, women and, and of course, many other groups. Right. Um, so it's like, were you trying to create, let's say, like a, a revolution for those people? Right it would have been absolutely necessary to strengthen the Republican side, which is the uh, focus on positive freedom, um, because of, uh, you know, for example, the kind of repressions and violence that it would have been required, right, um, to elevate those people uh, to, to a level where they could have participated uh, as members of a civic society on par, right, with the sort of owners of means of production who had, you know, been instantiated by the American state. And so like the Civil War, which, you know, in a certain sense is, just trying to, uh, you know, and, and Lincoln makes this point hermeneutically, which is just trying to, um, you know, fulfill in a certain way or consummate, um, you know, uh, what was already written, you know, in the uh, Declaration of Rights and Rights and, and Declaration. What is it? Declaration of Rights and Independence. What is it? Declaration of Independence. Right. OK. I don't know. Whatever. The American Constitution. OK. Like in a certain way, I'm not an expert in American history. <laughs> in a certain way, it was only trying to, to, to consummate this. Um, necessarily terminated in like mass violence. And I think like, you know, uh, half a million deaths, which of course was just, you know, way more substantial than subsequent American wars as a percentage of the population, right? Um, so it shows you the way that in a way there's already something kind of, kind of uh, screwy about the ideological composition of the United States, right? Um, because in a way it urges you to subjectivate yourself uh, you know, in a society in which the stress is on liberal negative freedom, in spite of potentially being disadvantaged to such a degree um, that you don't in any genuine sense enjoy the, the, the benefits of that, right? Does that make sense as kind of an analysis? Yeah, yeah I, also, I also want to say about, about the, what's interesting about the, like, as I would read this, so Mark's talking about um mark's talking about uh cooperation now if you look at some of his other works like when he talks about social labor right he describes this as kind of like the originary basis of labor in which individuals would like hunt together or whatever you mm -hmm. know this kind of thing i mean so i thought it was interesting elliot when you were talking about you it was like really interesting because you said anarcho primitivist then you really made the, you like you very quickly made a shift to like anarcho futurist yeah uh, and I think this captures kind of the dialectical dimension of Marx's analysis, um, because I think, um, you know, his point would be that, uh, you know, like originarily the performance of social labor was a collective enterprise, right? But then it was atomized, right, through the development of like commodity producing society, right? You know, and he gives examples from agriculture, right? He talks about the South where you don't need like, you know, the, you don't have the same conditions as with the mass industrial labor force. But then arguing that, um, that in a certain sense, there's a dialectical reprisal of those conditions that were originary uh, for humans, in the, but in the tech, more technologically dense atmosphere of the modern factory, right? So in that way, you can see it as kind of, you know, you, you can see the anarcho 
uh, primitivist and the anarcho futurist, right? Yeah. On side. Well, I think it's even important for anar anarcho, you could say, syndicalists or you know people who might typically be less or anarcho um, communists in general who might be less prone to reading Marx to understand that eventually there's a necessity of an authoritative will, right? But yeah. But this is this is your psychoanalytic side, right? There has to be a <laughs> right, there has to be a a master, right? There has to be like a, a big other. Who well, it's not, it. but you know, it's not. You can almost say it's psychoanalytically true because mm -hmm. of what. But Marx says it better than Freud, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. Marx, Marx here, sort of, right? You know. You could look, I think we could probably even go to the family structure and we can look at the family structures just because it's a group. There mm. becomes a necessity for an authoritative will, mm. um, which, you know, often goes to the eldest people in the group. And because um, it makes sense, because you're taking care of a baby, you're not going to be like, hey, baby, what are we, you know, what are we going <laughs> to, what are we going to do? <laughs> oh, it's, you can't speak? Oh, I guess uh, we'll wait until you can speak so you can vote. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which kind of reminds me of Elon Musk's baby, who wants, oh. who will speak, who once they can decide their gender will decide, but they're they're revoking their authority, uh, it's, which is interesting. A uh, bit. I don't I don't know how far that that train of logic goes, but in the the attempt to remove the that authoritative piece from the family structure, right? Um, yeah, I think I think maybe anarcho -tran transhumanists don't have this problem because they don't. What did they try to do to organize? I don't. I don't think they try to organize much. I know. Um, you. I know. Um, the futurist ideas are like the patchwork ideas, which are like the accelerations. But I mean, I, I don't see any patches for some reason. <laughs> That's so odd because they have the money to do it. Like when I so I went to, I went and I I, I met actually met Mencius Molbug, the alt right. You know the neo mm -hmm. react like the head neo reaction guy, and mm -hmm. you know who was there was because it, Justin Murphy was holding an event, and I was like, I'm gonna go. It's right next to me. Mm -hmm. And Peter Thiel shows up, and Peter Thiel's a b billionaire, and he's like sitting right in front of me. And mm -hmm. I had this thought, like, where is their system? They have the money, but it it almost seems such an idealist um, circle jerk, right? More so than the left. Um, in mm -hmm. terms of the anarcho, why not anarcho transhumanist? One, it's like. It's contradictory because it doesn't make any sense that you, anarchism or lack of authority goes together with technology. And because of that, you could say tendency is it's a circle jerk. As someone says anarcho trans feminist, I. Oh, I have to look at the live comments, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the ones from Facebook. <laughs> are you talking? Yeah. The ones from. <laughs> yeah. The ones from YouTube are good. Saludos. Uh <laughs> So I just no, want to say, I want to say for me, for me, because yeah. someone asked here about anarchism and the assumption of individualism. Yeah. And I don't want to get like, full in, I don't want to get like full into questions till maybe another half hour. But um, I think one thing, if I were to identify um, the, uh, the failing of anarchism in this respect, I think it would be that like, so in a certain, in a certain way, the problem you could say with Marx is that there's not enough totality, right? Like, and I mean that in the specific sense that um, like the problem with, uh, you know, the reproduction of capital, the structure of value is that it always has to find something that's not valorized outside of it. Right. And in fact, it always has to maintain something that's not valorized outside of it. Right. Because if everything were explicitly valorized, there'd be nothing that is not valorized that you could absorb into the structure of value. Right. Okay. Um, so what I mean is like, I think that the, so for in a way, like Mark, in a way that for Marx, like the only uh, way that this dilemma will be overcome is if you have like a comp you know, uh, I guess, and you can trace this in kind of a Postonian reading from value self-actualization. But when you have like, uh, you know, a society or an economy that's not characterized by that decision, right? Of value, non-value, use value, exchange value, and so on, right? There's like a, a, a very definitive kind of dualism about that. But I think what I'm trying to get at here is that like, it's like Marx's sort of point is that um, you know, it requires, you know, once you have this kind of total totality, right, that that uh, in a way opens the door for greater recognition of like the individual parts, right? And this is very obviously like dialectical point, right? So it's like, I think, for example, Zizek 
kind of made mm -hmm. this point about um, about what's going on between Spain and Catalonia, right? And some of the disputes they've been having. Um, and Zizek basically said the problem, you know, it's not the solution here isn't pro Spain or pro Catalonian so much as it uh, is that there should be a stronger European structure. And were there a stronger European structure that would diminish the significance of these particular conflicts, right? Because it would create a kind of larger structural field right you know into which you know catalonia could would be able to assume a certain independence right as a constituent of the Euro union the european union right so this is kind of what i'm getting over the, the the issue of anarchism right it's like mm -hmm. you know for marx i don't think it's particularly helpful like you know at this present moment you know when we're so like bogged down by by social totalities right capitalist totalities um you know to kind of rush out and be like i'm gonna do things myself you know like that's not yeah um necessarily the most productive but he does you know this is where certainly where an anarchism and marxism converge uh is in a more futural assessment of you know um a the possibility of creating a society in which um you know and i, I don't want to even restrict it just to human individuality because the question really here is about use value you know and that you could say like the domain of sensuality more generally but it's, it's actually requires some work to conceptualize but where particularity let's say uh becomes more apparent because it's not it's not subsumed and aggressed right uh by the structure of value does that make sense you've been good yeah yeah well uh, <laughs> yeah yeah by the way about about <laughs> anarchists i think now that and i just want to say now i think the most interesting work being done on anarchism at this like very moment is maybe by mm. catherine Mal catherine malibu Oh, yeah, um, what's, what's she talking about? What's Catherine? Well, talking about? I mean, I don't know because she hasn't written her book yet, but she has a lecture on like Bitcoin because she signed the current like John McA McAfee's uh, currency declaration of independence. Uh -huh. um, and, and then she was talking about why she signed it. Um, but it seems to me there's a weird because you were talking about like how like it's just like idealism. But I feel like uh, in her lecture, what's interesting is it's anarchist, but it's also kind of like historical materialist in the sense that she sees anarchism is like imminent to capital itself and specifically yeah. like the, division, the division between like big tech and like more traditional um capitalist enterprises right and and she sees like the conflict over bitcoin right as falling along these lines mm -hmm. right enterprises that you know conceptualize themselves as being wholly dependent on government right and thus want to kind of strengthen it as a structure uh versus uh, enterprises that have more, a more anarcho-capitalist pretension where they're like, fuck government, we don't want to pay taxes. You know, I, well, also, I wonder how true that is in terms of how the state supports capital and corporations, you know, in the in neoliberal, that's sort of the neoliberal model, which is the state management of um, enterprise. Are, like, are, the, are, are corporations really better off in anarchist? Um, you know, like everyone sort of takes Ayn Rand for granted because she argues sort of unsavory points. It's like, oh yeah, I'm pro corporation, ergo I'm a libertarian. You know, is that really the best um, argument for corporations? Or maybe we're currently living in the most, um, I don't think it is. I, I think we're living in the most rational, <laughs> you could say the most rational pro corporation. Um, environment there is or pro enriching that arc capitalist right mm -hmm. um with the government sort of support i won't i think i think that that i think that reading that that they take is sort of risks missing um the point to, to the extent which you know our current governments are complicit with capital and sort of work uh you know to help these sort of you know, large large corporations. You know, they tax they tax workers. They benefit from public utilities, and then they wind up paying zero dollars in taxes. So, um. well, that's always, that's that's always the paradox of these things, right? So, like, if you look at places yeah. where Bitcoin is mined, right? Like, you know, some like China is the biggest area. Uh, Venezuela is very popular Bitcoin mining there. Um, but it's like these are places where, you know, you, like power is the essential. You know, access to power is the essential thing that governs the capacity. Uh, this algorithmly driven generation of, of Bitcoin, right, um, by a blockchain, um, and it's like in Venezuela, it's popular because the cost of power is is subsidized by the socialist government, right? So that's actually why people are doing Bitcoin mining there, right? Um, yeah. So I mean, I think I feel like I feel like the overall 
Um, I feel like the overall, I mean, I think the, the issue here and, and the contradiction is that, um, you know, it's possible for tech companies to uh, view themselves as independent of the nation form to a certain extent because um, they're managing like globalized networks, right? Um, so, you know, the services they provide are in no way like Facebook or something, right? Are not uh, reducible to the context of a local area or a national area or anything like that. But then the actual paradox of this is that while you could say uh, that, um, you know, while you could say that the, the that the, you know, the resources tech companies require for their their material reproduction, like um, you know Chinese labor or whatever, are international to an extent, they would also be impossible to organize without the intervention of let's say particular governments. So right, we we actually have a question. I wonder I wonder if we can. Um, help this person out. Hello, a question here. I've been wondering, is there a shift of authority from the government towards corporations, corporate government, a transmission of power, certain capacities of the government being transferred to corporations? So is there a shift? Privatization is? Um, certainly, yeah, I, I would say, I would say definitely like Alonzo that authority gets shifted to the government only in so far as corporations or corporations end up writing the laws for the government, right? Um, and the government, when um, especially locally, when there's like a large corporation, you know, the government protects and does everything it can to serve uh, the sort of area of capital, and not just um, just capital in the abstract, but the capitalist who owns the corporation, what what they want from the government. So there's definitely um, definitely a shift of authority from the governments towards corporation. Corporate government is the question, right? Is it a transmission of power? It will never be corporate government in terms of you'll never get like, um, uh, you know, like Nike brand state, right? It'll always rather be something or Apple, a Apple state, the Apple state. <laughs> um, you'll never see something like that um, because you know, the government exists as the sort of, you know, the mask of, of capital in terms of one, it's like, oh, you, we provide jobs and then, yeah. um, and we're good and ergo, we want, we want the jobs here. And um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, it, it's not because there wasn't a second part. It was just, I just totally blanked out. This would be this would be Mark this would be Marx's point, right? Like his, his yeah. point would be that uh, his point would be that um, you know when you reach, I mean, not, not that this is his point as such, but we can deduce this when you reach a certain level yeah. of of cooperative demand, right? In terms of massification, yeah. that the only the only like you know Marx, I think, assumes throughout capital that you know in a more rapid manner than it's actually transpired, mm -hmm. let's say, that that would, uh, you know, contribute to the engendering of a socialist state, right? Now, mm -hmm. in actuality, that now th those those did occur, right? Mostly in areas that were trying to, you know, pursue capital accumulation in the first instance, ironically. Mm -hmm. um, but in actuality, uh, you know, what happened in large part was that um, you had, and Baron and Sweezy talk about this, like the age of monopoly capital. Right. So you had like, you know, uh, a handful of like monopoly corporations, right, who were, who were more and more powerful, um, playing a cooperative role in governance itself and being delegated, right, uh, to control, uh, you know, those industries that required that kind of massification. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this is, uh, you know, this again can be deduced uh, what from what Marx is saying that, that like we see today, for example, that, you know, um, without proposing some kind of harebrained thing that the only immediately available options that seem to exist to us uh in terms of organizing production in a way that's consistent with these structures um you know which would be necessary in the present um would be either one having like a highly centralized socialist state or two right uh having uh, a state that is l larger you know a, a government that's larger uh, than the governments were in the 19th century that is involved in organizing production with alongside monopoly capital, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I just want to say that, like, I think in a certain way, um, when you, yeah, like, I think, you know, you see how this comes around, like, I mean, Machiavelli says, you know, in The Prince, he says, like, 
yeah, like you probably shouldn't rely on mercenaries because like if you look at history, they tend to just turn around and like fuck you up after you've hired them. Um, you know, you hire them to invade a place, then they're like, yeah, actually, we'll keep this. Um, <laughs> And I think I think a good example of that is like when you when you as a government, right, provided that it's your your goal, it's your problem, provided it's your goal to actually maintain the integrity of government, which it may never have been. But if it were your goal to maintain some kind of integrity uh, or to build an integrity within government, if you commission like these large scale monopol monopolistic corporations, you know, um, to uh, and you cooperate with them to accumulate, you know, all of these resources and erect these structures, right, necessary to uh, the development of what Marx describes here as cooperation, that it's not that surprising. It shouldn't be that surprising that they eventually accumulate enough power that they're able to turn it around, uh, you know, and impose demands on government in a manner that they never were before. Right. Does that answer the question? I hope so. I think, I think so. And then this one as well, which is similar. Aren't corporation inherent to states you could say they literally are like you need a you need a <laughs> state to, in terms of well like in the in the it's a good this is a good hegel lesson yes because the corporation is defined as a corporation through the state um can't just um it wouldn't be a corporation without the state incorporating it. yeah but but again I, like and just to respond right. to this again like marx's point would have been that also that you don't need actually like corporations are a way of resolving the problem of um of you know the increased demand for massification associated with with the, with the cooperation of labor uh without you know directly resorting to widespread socialization right so again if you're if you're talking about like he gives examples of agriculture right if you're looking at you know like it's just you know the question has to be what is the state right you know and if we're talking about i don't know like a like um a feudal state. I mean, they wouldn't have needed anything, you know, anything like a modern corporate structure, right? They had guilds, right? And we already talked about guilds and how they were limited in terms of the number of employees that they could have um, mm -hmm. expressly, right? Uh, corporations, you know, are not limited in that way because they have to respond to uh, the demands of a massification associated with manufacture and later with capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Here in Mexico, we had a very um, particular development along capitalism. I don't know if you, got, if you Americans had it, but I'd like to know. We had uh, two concepts, uh, Raya and Tienda de Raya. Raya was like a payroll, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Tienda de Raya was uh, Raya store, you know, store where you spent that particular payroll. So you, you, you worked at a plantation, you worked at a pseudo corporation, at a proto corporation, and you got paid. But instead of getting paid in pesos, in the national currency, you got paid in made up money. And that made up money, you could only spend, that made up money was the Raya, and you could only spend this made up money, this Raya, in the Raya stores, in the tiendas de Raya. So you had a whole bunch of people, a whole society of people, uh, groups of people who were enslaved to a particular capitalist who paid in his own currency. And those people could only buy resources through that currency in that like microstate. That this... Wait, wait, sorry. They, they were paid in a unique currency. Yeah, in Raya. Like voucher payments, okay. Yeah, 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 exactly, like vouchers. Yeah. Did you I guys think, have like I, voucher I, I think I think Marx actually, I could be wrong, but I think he may actually give that as an example of capitalist oppression in capital. But oh, it was terrible. If anyone, if anyone knows, because I think that may have been happening in Marx's time. If anyone knows if that's true about capital, it's possible I read it somewhere else. But yeah, that did happen in, in Canada, for example. Okay. And I think that happened almost everywhere. Right. We yeah, had like yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that was restricted. Yeah. And actually, in a way that that's interesting because that's sort of I mean, Alexander Kojiev calls um, Henry Ford the greatest uh, Marxist of the 20th century. <laughs> um, but I think I think in a way that that's <clears throat> uh, that is partly in indirectly because uh, like it, when that first happened, I think it was very kind of brutal and direct. Um, but, you know, like Ford took a slightly subtler approach, right? Where he would like build things and then he would give like a certain discount, right? He would build them so that they were optimally uh, structured, right? For his workers, right? In Detroit being sort of ground zero for this, right? Mm -hmm. And then he would give them like a certain discount, right? And then that just spread to, you know, obviously cars, which they built, but also homes, right? Vacations and all kinds of things, right? Um, so the massification of the workers was being organized through their consumption. Right. And Ford also rationalized this because he had such a large labor force. And keep in mind, capital was more localized in that time. 
that he said like, well, if I do this, then these people are going to be able to like buy back the stuff we've made. So he was already, he was basically already trying to creating like a micro Keynesian economy, oh, right? E even before, no, and this is absolutely amazing, right? If you study it, um, he was already creating a kind of micro Keynesian economy before that principle had become totally absorbed, uh, you know, as a principle of governance by the American state, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you know, in Italy, you have like workers city, you know, like in North Italy, you have like workers cities and all kinds of things like that, right? And some, actually, I heard about one in Italy, and like I think the the factory owner was also, there's some examples of this historically, but he was also like mm -hmm. a socialist, and he was like, I want my workers to live in this like socialist paradise or something. Like it was even, you know, it's not like it wasn't even instrumental like Ford. It actually had like an ideological orientation as well. Interesting. I think that's in the the Le Bagne Rouge of um, of uh, Bologna. I think that was where that happened. This is kind of, I have a general, there's a general sort of question. <laughs> we think that the pandemic and the quarantine will profoundly impact the class relationships. Yeah. The funny <laughs> answer would be no. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be good, that'd be a good answer. No, next question. <laughs> no, no, they will not. Well, well, it will, it will. <clears throat> it's already impacted it. Yeah. It was essential, just material well, but, analysis. Like, like, like depression always does, it fucks over people, you know, who are the lowest kind of in the social hierarchy, the first, right? So we see this already, right? Where, um, you know, people who are living to paycheck, paycheck to paycheck are obviously, you know, extremely damaged by this to the point that, um, you know, and this is why obviously <clears throat> there's a movement to stimulate, like to the point where, you know, they lack, even the conditions to reproduce their own labor, they're insufficiently organized to do that. Um, women, obviously, like, you know, uh, uh, working from home, um, you know, much more, you know, in terms of the responsibilities women are taking for in terms of childcare, that's much more difficult. Um, we know, and this is more of a, uh, you know, a vector of nature, but we know that uh, the pandemic is targeting people whose health is frailer, right? People who are older and mm -hmm. so on. Um, you know, a lot of, of service jobs, which are precarious, right? you know, are not going to be deemed essential, right? Um, you know, restaurants, bars, and so on, right? And those people are going to lose their work. So I think the inherent tendency right now uh, is for an increasing stratification owing to what's happening. Um, the question really concerns, the question really uh, of how bad it's going to get is one I can't answer because that really concerns um, what the willingness of governments will be to use fiscal policy uh, in a way that would be necessary to seriously ameliorate the consequences of what's going on. But let's be clear, like the use of fiscal policy so far, like this $1,200 thing you got in the States or whatever, right? you can buy a yeah. you can buy a PlayStation 4 or whatever. I, um, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I did get it. I did, I did get it. Uh, <laughs> oh, I that's got right. it direct deposited. <laughs> I said, yeah, I've never directly profited off death before. It was the first, but you know, that's, that's a mistake, isn't it? Because of course I've never, I got $1,200 exactly to me um from and then i did there's like a direct correlation uh or causation from you know the virus and the virus deaths to me getting twelve hundred dollars but of course there's the state that you know of course you profit from death all the time right so mm -hmm. that's so it's a very interesting immediate notional incorrect take i had <laughs> <laughs> And why it's I like, like, I like, I like it putting forth ideology and then auto correcting to science. All in the well, that, like what do you seconds. think? Look, look, it's Hegel, Hegel, <laughs> phenomenology of spirit. There, it's a painting. Oh, is that okay? Oh, yeah, it's okay, nice. Okay, yeah. Cool. Where'd you get that? I made it, bro. Can you make one? Can yeah, I'll Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, I'll commission. I got, all, I got all the, uh, I got the paints right here, bro. Okay. <laughs> and a copy of, and a copy of Zizek in the clinic. I see, which yeah, I'm gonna read. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I have mine right here. You wrote that. You wrote that. You wrote that wonderful. You wrote that wonderful review of our of Myth and Mayhem, right? Which is getting round. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, it had one star because of the Peterson people <laughs> immediately hopping on and one starring it. So I figured the best I could do is, <laughs> is at least you know. Well, yeah, there were the two reviews. No. The two there were two reviews. We'll get back to the book. I just want to say quickly there there were two reviews written about us. The first one said that. Uh, no, the book is called The Leftist Critique of Jordan Peterson. The first yeah, one is. That this book is garbage because of it. its left <laughs> the book is garbage because of its left wing bias, whereas that's announced in the title. And the second yeah. one cited a passage out of context and accused us of anti Canadian racism. Oh that yeah, was, which you are Canadian. 
Yeah, well, actually, Matt's Canadian. I'm Canadian, and Greg is Canadian. So three of the six oh, that's people. three Canadian. I didn't even three know of the this. six people. Yeah, maybe it's internalized Canadian. racism against from Canadianness, <laughs> Conrad. <laughs> um, but okay, yeah. So so back to the book. Um, we have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back Iron? back. <laughs> uh, yeah. So about 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 anarchism, though. I think, I think the problem with anarchism, this would be my basic, you know, issue. I think there are strong indications um, in, uh, you know, and this would be kind of the more scientific side of Marx's work. I think there are strong indications that, and it's complex to look at this through Marx's work, but there's strong indications that um, the notion of individuality as we understand it uh, is in fact a consequence of the reproduction of capital and value, right? Yeah. So yeah, you know, like he, this is this that's, is addressed. That's important. So, yeah, this is addressed here, like when he says that uh, when he talks about the tension between like the collectivism, collectivization of production, um, and like the individuality of the wage labor relation. Um, but actually, there uh, there's another part in the book which is like maybe my favorite part in all of Capital. I mean, I've got like two or three, mostly in the early parts, which are the most Kind of philosophical and you know frustrating to more empirically oriented readers um but uh one of the things i really like there is he talks about the development of religion um and like i think the most like i'm going to describe it in a second i think the most radical hot take uh you could get from this is that marx is actually saying that god is like the value form that would be like but basically what he says is that um that as you progress towards a society that's mediated by the wage labor relationship, right, or the sale of labor power, right, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, like, he talks about the change change in religion. So for him, like, he suggests that monotheism um, is a consequence of uh, the organization of market economies. So he points out that like Jewish people uh, had trading economies long before other places, and they were monotheistic, and before that, monolatristic, and so on. Um, but then he go, so he he kind of explains the development of monotheism this way. But then he says like it seems like in a society based on this uh, comprised of private commodity producers that uh, a sort of individualized uh, monotheism is like the most appropriate uh, religious expression. So he cites Protestantism as representing this, right? Uh, and then uh, he alludes to the fact that like uh, Robespierre's deism, which like totally strips, you know. Uh, monotheism of any kind of, uh, I don't know how to say it, sort of aleatory ritualistic element, right? It's like a pure abstraction of like the deity. You know right? who else has an individualized uh, spirituality and it's not recognized at all, and in fact the opposite is this guy, is Hegel. Um, his view of like, if you like read through him, like he's, I think he gets this rap as like being like the state is God in the world to some mm -hmm. extent. But if you, but in the philosophy of right, um, or no, it's philosophy of history. The philosophy of history, he um, he states very explicitly that spirituality is a retreat from the state, and it's interesting because those are notes from his lectures. So maybe in his lectures, he's he's um, more Thanks inclined, more more in, well, he's more inclined yeah. in a monarchy to say these sorts of things than in when he's like writing it down, right? Um, so what he said is uh, that that through spirituality, um, one no longer serves the state. Um, they get a sort of respite from the state through God, right? Um, this kind of interesting versus, and then he, and then this is his critique of China <laughs> at the time, which is that China, because because God is the emperor in, mm -hmm. embodied, which you can still see as part of the Geist a little bit. Um, uh, God is the emperor embodied that in uh, there is no respite in China. Mm -hmm. um, in China. Isn't that the same? Trump to talk about that and say China. And he says, <laughs> well, you know, he, he should be like a right Hegelian. Will he, right Hegelian Trump? <laughs> okay. All right. For a second. <laughs> right. It's like, well, you know, you know, the Chinese, Chinese, Chinese folks guys, very bad. Okay. Very bad. The state. <laughs> State and is, and is in unity with uh, with religion. There's no respite for the people. Okay, 
The Chinese guy <laughs> is not a proper sublation, I have to say. Terrible dialect. <laughs> Terrible dialect. Worst dialectic. Worst but, dialectic. That's like the Simpsons guy time. now. Worst, worst, like, sort of slowly morphed into Simpsons guy. Worst dialectic ever. Wasn't that? Isn't that? Isn't that it, but, like, it's interesting, right? Because this is still, this is still, like, the, the critique of China that is mostly resorted to in the West. And I would say that that critique is, like, um, like obviously Hegel's approximate in a lot of um, non-European historical subjects, but like I do, I do think that there's something to his critique of, you know, um, like, like I'm not saying that it's perfectly articulated, but I do think there's something to it um, because I mean it's like what it's what Marx describes as um, uh, as the odic modes of production, right? Which mostly just in a certain way in Marx's discourse designates like things that aren't known, um, but you see this kind of uh, you know, because of the the continuation of feudality, um, combined with the the relatively vast centralization of the Chinese state within that context, let's say, obviously they couldn't acquire the same level of centralization as we'd see today. But nevertheless, uh, you see a kind of situation where <clears throat> um, you haven't had like the insinuation of private property into the society, right? Mm -hmm. So you haven't had like the consequent flourishing of individuality. Right. Uh, so you have like, you know, a, a society comprised of agricultural producers who all sort of kick up teeth to like a kind of, you know, vast imperial apparatus. Right. Um, and there's no mm -hmm. kind of slit. Right. You know, without without private property. Right. Without, uh, you know, the constituent elements of liberal society, like there's no kind of slit through which, uh, you know, that particular development of subjectivity could enter. Right, if that makes sense. So, like, again, like, I think you have to kind of take Hegel and sort of secularize him by looking at it through Marx, right? And I think that's how you're going to be able to understand how that works. But I think, in many ways, like, I think this is quite funny because it seems to me that all, like, the properties that we tend to ascribe, you know, as representing like the metaphysical virtues of Western society, um, I think in most cases are just, um, you know, uh, consequences of economic relations, right? Um, and, and you see that, like, so you already see, like, vast transformations in the structure of Chinese society, right? It's like, if you look at, like, how thoroughly individualistic Hong Kong became, right, um, you know, as a consequence of its economic modernization, mm -hmm. um, you know, that attests to the fact that we're not talking about, it's like, it, it's not like, you know, it's not as if these are just ideas, right? You know, and that that's that's very important to keep in mind, right? Speaking of just ideas, how long will Marx's analysis be applicable to y'all reckon? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> yeah, someone said someone said until the end of history, probably. Until the end of history. Yeah. Well that's a that's a big one. I would say until I mean, obviously I'm speculating now. <laughs> but like so so we'll start like if you start out like when he goes through like you know the, the, the value form, the money form, the commodity form, and so forth. It's like I think you just have to say that because already like actually, you know, in a certain sense, like the first three chapters of capital are the most enduring because they function at such a high level of abstraction. Right. Like um, and, you know, they're they're at a level of gener generality, which is like philosophical as well as material in a sense, let's say. Um, so I think that, you know, I think what you can see with capital is like as he progresses, um, you know, there's this author who wrote the book, uh, Marx's Inferno, right, about kind of going down into hell. Right. Like a as he progresses deeper and deeper right into the sort of enclaves and crevices right, of the capitalist exploitative system, that there's more particularity there, right? Certainly, um, not that there's any absence of industry today, it's much more common than in Marx's time, but like in the nations he's describing, let's say there's been a lot of changes in how labor functions, right, where his analysis wouldn't be so relevant, at least to that. So you might mm -hmm. have to talk about China or something, right? But then, I, but then again, like, I think that when you step back from it and you look at kind of the bigger, um, bigger philosophical picture, bigger economic picture, uh, I think that that will be relevant until such time as the value form itself uh, ceases to exist, right? Um, sure. Yeah. So that's when my the, dog moment. There. When the when the value form ceases to exist. Yeah, which is what you would need, right? Like to 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 really get to a point where you were totally beyond capitalism. I wonder, you, like, not even my, capitalism, like beyond commodity producing society. So here's me. Here's me being. Let me let me be a like a. Let me be like a, a bad worker Hegelian. So, yeah, which is, if if China, you think if China is still sort of maybe this maybe it's like five leaps too far. If China still ha is sort of like um, 
within the geist of China and the U.S. is still within the geist of China or within the geist of China, within the geist of the U.S., right, of freedom and then of uh, how society is structured, what chance is there to eliminate the value form? Do you think, do you think the cultural, there is like a cultural map to sort of overcome the value form or is it, or is it so ingrained that it's just impossible to do something that radical? Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, Ernesto, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, if, is it impossible to overcome capitalism without, uh, with the US and China in the way? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no, with, um, with, a, with a country's sort of intrinsic cultural habits, you could almost say. Is it, is it possible to do something like eliminate the value form? Or is it, um, maybe, <laughs> I, I could answer, <laughs> my, I guess my answer is like, that's what, that's, that's the North Korean philosophy anyway, um, in terms of like, well, in terms of, <laughs> I, now that I asked that question, I remember in North Korea, the, the Juche, yeah, the Juche philosophy is um, each people mm -hmm. are, cannot impinge on the other people and then they will create socialism in their nation and then eventually socialism worldwide. I don't even know to the does any do you have any idea what the value form looks like in North Korea? I have no clue how commodities work in North Korea. Well, it'd be um, it'd be it'd be, it'd be it'd be it'd be it'd be semi operative, let's say. Like I so I think like in that kind of context like obviously it wouldn't be nearly as developed as in like South Korea. So like but they're still functioning international marketplace. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the broad contours of their society and production are still going to be structured around that. But there's also going to be a lot of there's going to be a greater ratio of like pre-capitalist enclaves. Right. Which is yeah. like why, in a way, the governance lends itself toward like pre-liberal capitalist feudal subordination. Right. Um, <laughs> which is like maybe a problem as well. Yeah. Maybe a problem. Um, feudalism. I, I do like this well, anime. It's dynastic drama. feudalism to a certain extent, which you don't even see in um, any Marxist Leninist countries, really. You don't see that degree of dynastic sort of, um, right? Yeah, well, I think I think it's going to change, right? Because like, especially mm -hmm. if Kim, Kim Jong Un, especially if Kim Jong Un survives, he's he's been doing. It's like a te obviously by any kind of you know quotidian Western moral standard, he's like a terrible person, but he's been doing a really good job with the country. So you know they've signed Belt and Road, you know uh, greater diplomacy with South Korea, you know economic development uh, and military security. Um, so yeah, the country that's will. True. How do you mention it? <laughs> well, it's just it's and not. He did. He did inherit North Korea, so media. it's like it's like he's not gonna he's not gonna dismantle the essential, very um, backed by the gun, like you know the critique of the weapon, he, like um, he couldn't. Um, there's only so much. I if you even if you are handed power in such a country, um, that you probably actually that's not true. I take it. You know what? <laughs> I keep having these moments where I say something like you said, and then I'm like. And I'm like, well, it's not kind of true because if you do have absolute power, you can sort of make a big decision. Like, um, but you, reform a lot. yeah, okay, well, well, okay. So with him, he he was supposed to be survived for like a month or consign himself to being a puppet of his uncle, but they managed to execute his uncle, um, who's yeah, not his missile. biological uncle, not his biological uncle. The media never says that either. Oh, um, interesting. Uh, but um, no, and the, nor does the media tend to mention that there was like actually a military spate between troops. That were loyal to his uncle and, and loyal to him, and that was the trigger that caused him to call for the execution, which was organized by his sister, I think. Yeah, the execution um, was. Did he was wasn't he executed by a missile? No, he wasn't executed by a missile. He was. My understanding of it is he was executed by. He was marched out on live TV of the mm -hmm. like bullet row or whatever, and then he was executed by a firing squad, and then they used flamethrowers to destroy the body. I believe. Wow. It was wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's so much. I'm. I'm. I'm glad you're telling us. Of this yeah I, yeah I, yeah I yeah i had heard that he was killed by an airstrike but you know that's that's i don't know if that's more terrifying i think it is that's well kim Jong-un kim Jong -un, kim Jong -un, <laughs> kim Jong -un did some he, he did some like michael corleone shit because he like wasn't supposed to be you know he wasn't supposed to be to get in the position he is and a lot of it probably comes from the fact that he was able to like cleverly persuade the chinese that he would pursue an agenda that was uh genial enough to their desire uh, that they were like, okay, whatever, go ahead with your uncle. Because I think that the, the claim of the uncle was that uh -huh. he, he wanted to say like, oh, Kim Jong Un's just going to be like the old guys, and I'm the modernizer. Because China wants North Korea to pursue like a similar trajectory of like modernization as it's pursued. 
Um, but I think Kim Jong-un was able to persuade the Chinese that like, yeah, okay, we'll do, we'll do this. Um, but like, just fuck off with my uncle stuff and we'll get him. <laughs> and, then, and then we cannot have a civil war here and kind of, you know, um, yeah. so that was, but it's been very, he's been, he's been, I mean, he totally outmaneuvered Trump, obviously he's been very, very successful. Oh yeah. Um, great to see millennials, you know, going out in the world, uh, <laughs> you know, it's great. great people in my generation getting out there, you know, being, who says we can't succeed? Um, but we were talking about, you were talking about the value form, right? Um, and what I would say about that is that, um, about the value form, um, I mean, that's kind of the point of capital. I mean, all yeah, three, right. right? Like, <laughs> sure. That's kind of the point. So if you, if you, if you think, if you ask a question, like, is, can the value form be overcome, right? Like the only, you know, thoroughly Marxist response to that would be that it has to be overcome um, because, I mean, if I'm just going to be really succinct about it, because of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, right? So like, there's just no way for capitalism yeah. to permanently maintain its profit rates, like in a context where, uh, like it has means of, 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 you know, trying to get them upward, right? Mm -hmm. But there's like, there's a downward pressure that's exerted by uh, the entire history of capitalist technological development, you know, and in that basis, you can understand like a lot of like the, the phenomenon um, that have occurred like in the last few decades, right? Um, you know, like neoliberalization, like uh, the reliance on foreign labor and so forth um, as efforts to combat uh, a rate of profit that was indeed falling. But then like, there's all kinds of disputes between economists like on this. So like Thomas Piketty says, oh, well, the rate of profit hasn't fallen you know, and then like someone else will go look at his data and be like, well, if you divide this by this, right? <laughs> like, um, because even how you measure that is contested economically, you know, and, and that that's that's sort of an issue with that. But the point is like that if you like, this is the big difference because Marxists will generally criticize Keynesianism, right? Which uh, Keynesianism is concerned with like cyclic underconsumption that arises, you know, in the context of recession, right? And the Marxist critique of that would be that like they're just seeing the surface phenomenon right like that, it, that it, they're not, no marxist i think would say that it's not useful i don't know maybe some fucking crazy accelerationist but like a few marxists would say it's not useful um, <laughs> but <There it> <laughs> uh yeah um yes people at zero books probably only ones in the but uh uh not too many marxists would say it's not useful or like correct on that level but what they would tend to approach keynesianism with is representing a kind of surface manifestation so like we could say someone like thomas piketty is in the keynesian tradition because he dismisses the tendency rate of profit to fall. And then he's like, well then, but we still have a problem, which is the capital increases at a greater rate than the general economy. So how do you do, how do you fix that? Well, you just redistribute. And then if you redistribute, you never have a problem, right? Because yeah. then you, you're able, you're able to, to, you're able to, to like have living standards rise in a way that's like, you know, somewhat approximate with the development of, uh, of capital itself. Right? Value form sounds like a princess. <laughs> okay. oh, form, I'm curious. I'm curious about that. Yeah. It is true. It is true, though, that like it's a little bit like Princess Peach in the original Mario, because every single time you like make inroads toward like you like get there, and it's like, sorry, Mario, but your princess is in another castle, and that's kind of like the value form and it's overcoming summed up. Oh wow, mm, that was a good. That was a good off bung. <laughs> um, doesn't something doesn't something to replace the primacy. Doesn't something to replace the primacy of value form? I'm sorry, am I over value form? Is it, well, I think, I think, value I think, form is I think, another capital. I like yeah. all value form is. So, uh, this, another is this is other Elliot. There's two admins for this page. So other, they're both named Elliot. Oh, I thought you just created two accounts to, to write. No, 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 no. This is, this is Elliot. Like properly no, this is actually a second Elliot who lives in Portland. Okay. Um, <laughs> Was it him who wrote the review too? <laughs> no, no, mine's one L and one T. His is okay. Two well, then, L's. Get, then get him to write a review. <laughs> and two, oh yeah. So uh, yeah, there you go. I want every Elliot working for us. <laughs> oh yeah, there's another Elliot too. We've, we've actually talked about doing a podcast. He spells it differently too. Elliot uh -huh. Jensen. Uh, someone asked. Someone asked <laughs> about the, the overcoming of of the value form. Um, yeah. Okay. So this actually is like my. This is the big question I've been grappling with lately, and I haven't really reached like a. A theoretical conclusion regarding it yeah. but i know like in um, in the dialectics of nature Engels says like he's like yes humans have always tried to like you know understand the structure of nature um but like our understanding of it's now fettered by like capitalism the value form um but then he kind of speculates about after capitalism and he's like well there's still be like situations where we don't understand 
how nature functions. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that like, you know, if, even if you're trying to imagine organizing production on the basis of use value, it still has to be based on ass assessments of like, what's going to work, how is nature structured and so on, right? So you still have to have some kind of like, you know, uh, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily function formally. We could say, so you know, that it wouldn't function formally like the value form, but uh, there would still have to be some way uh, of doing that. Now the, now the range of concerns being addressed would encompass like all things that are currently treated as externalities vis-a-vis -vis the value form. Right, you know, and that 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 obviously human welfare, um, you know, and then everything that that's bound up with, right? So of course now we realize more and more that like, you know, it's in a certain sense human welfare is inextricable from a range of environmental concerns. Well, then that has to be, right? These sort of free riders have to be worked in, right? Uh, but yeah, the point is like I I don't I think that there always there has to be a way of of thinking about um, productivity that's uh, that's eman emancipated from the value form, but but still allows us to think it. Right. So if that's not a very satisfying conclusion, I just want to say it's something I'm working yeah. on. But that's good. Yeah, it's something to figure out. Here's here's enough <laughs> that surely that would be probably... uh, I like that. I assume that's sarcastic. It is. Um... I think so. I, there's um there's a Nick Land YouTube video called the How Blockchain Over Solves the Problem of Space Time. He also never says how blockchain solves the problem of space time. Um, in that video, surely blockchain will solve the problem of the value form. Not how sure how the, it would do that. How the fuck does it solve the problem <laughs> of space time? Like, is it like? Is See, it, that's how he. That's how he drags you in because well, like, I know that he. <laughs> I, I know that he deduces. I know that. Yeah, I know that he deduces. Like, I know he claims. Like, uh, what is it? Like the the Kantian. Uh, what is it? The Kantian. Uh, it's since yeah, the synthetic a priori in Kant for Nick Lond, mm. Nick Lond. Uh, well, you're, is, you're um, Canadian, you're forgiven. Yeah. <laughs> the synthetic, the synthetic a priori. Uh, that's a French. It's just a French thing I'm doing here by accident, actually. But yeah. the synthetic a priori uh, is um, it, like he says, it's like it's a way of mapping what's not there, right? So it's like um, you know. Uh, it's this idea like with 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 the exchange abstraction or with capital accumulation, like Kant in a way circumscribes the structure of reality so that it's already mappable in advance of being known, like not its particular content, but let's say the form through which it's grasped. Yeah. So he draws an analogy yeah. between this and capitalist structures itself. So I guess the way you would argue that is like by saying that like the Bitcoin is like delocalized to a way. Like and like independent of certain Holy structures shit. associated that with capital. That actually makes sense. To in a way that, <laughs> <laughs> in a way that, so like if, if epistemic conditions themselves relate to relate to the commodity form. This right, this is then, how th this is how zero books solves the memes, which are absurdities. Because now Conrad here, zero books author, <laughs> is, has just actually explained how the blockchain solves the problem of space time. Why didn't it, it solves the problems? That's well, to me the weird thing. <laughs> the use of solve, I find that adjective, I find extremely puzzling. Like, how do you solve the problem of space and time? Like, like I mean, I guess like, I mean, I guess you could say like, well, if space and spatiotemporality emerges from the exchange of value. So like, isn't it the case that like, um, mathematics emerges with production, right? So if you, you could see, you could probably say like, well, in a certain way, the abolition of the value form would solve the problem of space and time, I guess. Uh, but like, I just don't see how the fuck blockchain would, <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how blockchain would represent that. Like, I'm pretty sure that that, well, I, that's not, that's not even that, a currency. Maybe, well, that's I a think, commodity. Like it's not a currency. A currency is something that has to be, is, is a definition of a currency. Well, I think what you said made this a lot of sense, synthetic a priori, which is it's not centrally located anywhere. And- um, Oh, I just see what because it, yeah, because it's not centrally yeah. located, it materially is a material answer to his Kantian point. Uh, in that sense, I don't know if that's what he meant, but yeah, that's so that's what I think. I guess, I guess that's the idea is like that that the synthetic synthetic a priority becomes like de untethered from its like physical and local manifestation. But the problem is that that doesn't really solve the problem of space and time, does it? It just delocalizes space and time, which. Would, is part of capital anyway. He also so said that only. So this is land. 
I think he also says that only works in a system that's closed. That's how you know this isn't a Doug cast. Because <laughs> Doug would not. He, did not. he also did say that only works in a system that's close enough together to have no lag. What does that mean? But like, I think the problem is there is no closeness with uh, the, virt the virtual space. There is material closeness, but eventually it, it's just overcome by technology. I'm like, I find that... This, this one. Sorry, continue. Well, like this, this for us in a certain extent is we are in a very real sense overcoming geographic location, but on, on a second sense, you can't. Oh, wait, so he's, he's overcome. Okay, register. but like that would just be interpreting space. That would be interpreting space to temporality as like, just like the turnover between like exchanges within capitalism. Like it wouldn't actually be in interpreting it as like an inherent structure of value that's like like marx talks he says like like uh time becoming space right he talks about you know uh in a society that time becomes adjudicated like space mm -hmm. right but it's like i guess what i'm saying is you can have instantaneous like instantaneous connection but then it's still like well i'm here spending two hours of my time talking to you guys right so as long as that indexes to a broader form of value there's still like a spatialization of temporality that's inherent to that whole process right because like time all still has to be it, spent right mm -hmm. and i use that adjective deliberately time still has to be spent um you know as long as you have a structure in which time is spatialized in that way right so it's like you can make that faster and faster which is all we're talking about if we're talking about eliminating turnover but i'm not sure how that would solve the problem of spatio-temporality again like i'm like unless he just means it in like a really banal sense like like a ted talk like you know like <laughs> like, like bitcoin <laughs> solves the problem of space well, i think maybe more accurately you would say bitcoin expands on the object or description of space time as a as a hyper object you could say or it, it provides another example or that it changes <laughs> that it changes that it changes the the structure yeah. of space temporality under capital would be the right way of putting it um yeah nick land people have been asking us about nick land like he is like his i mean it's really interesting like when you read fang numina because someone asked us about fang numina because it's like uh it kind of is like uh letters from algernon or something uh, <laughs> yeah like in the sense that like yeah, there, there it is. yeah like it's the first <laughs> two essays are like really good and then you just see this kind of thing like throughout the book where it's like it just like <laughs> <laughs> like it just like devolves into him like writing whole pages and like symbols. Like, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like and like, but, like I just you just read uh, for me. Well, I'm for sure. Algernon, by the way, for those that are not familiar, oh. is a story of a man who slow who gets a like a brain booster that slowly disintegrates. Um, his brain. Yeah. I thought it was yeah, a his... mouse. Sorry. Oh, am I missing it up? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's both. Or the mouse? It's both. Algernon okay. is the mouse. I've and... never read the book. ¿Cómo se llama el protagonista de Flores de Algarnón? <laughs> Charlie, ¿no? Sí, Charlie. Yeah, it's yeah, Charlie yeah, yeah, and yeah. Algarnón, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, no, I've never read it. I, that just, is I just like that. I like that metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> my my ex-girlfriend told me about it. An ex-girlfriend told me about it. I um, that in school, actually. <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's like a book. I think she probably did it in school. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah, and that's that's interesting. Just a quick thing. Like, in Canada, like, the only books we study are, like, anti-collectivist books. Like, so like, well, anti-utopian books, let's say. So like okay, every okay. book, every book you study in Canada, like it's really, really methodical. It's like Animal Farm, 1984, Lord of the Fro Flies, The Giver, like the Chrysalids, oh, yeah. like literally every book they teach you is just like pretty much like, you know, and if you try to improve the world, you're going to destroy it. That's like every, and you think about this, like it's extremely ideological too, right? Yeah, I mean, um, it makes sense in that framework where Peterson comes from then. Oh yeah, no, oh, yeah. I said this. Uh, did you read that? Have you read Myth and Mayhem, by the way? I ordered it. It's it's being shipped to me. Okay, um, you're gonna read the physical. Yeah. So I have like yeah, a yeah. Uh, I have a footnote somewhere where I talk about his like Kitsch Canadiana obsession with genocide, um, and like yeah, like you know, it's like every book we we study in school deals with this. But I and I think at that level of insistency, you have to think that it's functioning as part of like a larger like kind of um, neoliberal, you know, kind of ideological order, right? Um, but yeah. So yeah, with Nick Land. So Nick Land, though, I just want to Nick Land is weird. Uh, because this is hot takes. Nick Land is weird. Uh, <laughs> Nick Land is weird uh, because his reading of Deleuze, it's a really strange reading of Deleuze. Like my understanding of it. So you, in Deleuze, you have this like sub-representational um, and you see this in uh, difference in repetition. You have like the sub-representational 
uh, epistemology uh, that's mostly derived from like Bergson, right? And I can't, I can't, you know, uh, explicate all the details right now, but uh, basically, uh, Land views this as kind of a failure, right? He's like, well, this doesn't really explain like access or like it doesn't really get beyond our fundamental epistemological problematic. So Land kind of defers to anti adup right? Um, and uh, in anti adup you have like this this whole this idea of like intensification, right? Um, you know that, uh, and and that's the the what is it? Um, barbarian sav. It's from Lewis Henry Morgan. It's like barbarian savages, barbarians, civilization. Or it's this chapter about this where he says like we have to accelerate the process. But the point is like uh, that Land both dismisses any like epistemological significant like epistemological thematization of access that you'd find in Deleuze, as well as like Deleuze's subsequent backpedaling on the thesis of anti adipose and his effort to moderate. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> someone asked us a question, so we try to be we try to be genial. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. As well as Deleuze's later effort to moderate that thesis in a thousand plateaus. So so all you're left with is this kind of intensification, right, which he interprets, and there's a basis for this in Deleuze, as uh, being a kind of deepening of capitalist processes of accumulation, right? So for him, it's like, well, any kind of any kind of utopianism is like a distraction from that. It's totally irrelevant. It, you know, it's just like, you know, it's a fantasy that is imminent to capital itself, right? To capital accumulation itself, and all you can kind of do is just like deepen that process of accumulation and see where it gets you. But like, I mean, when you kind of like, I, when you run through the details, it's actually like kind of it's kind of like infantile. I don't know, like it's like. You're just, like, just go, man. Like it's like, um, you know, it's just like it's not it's not that well argued, right? Like I think I think in his early days he was like a talented thinker, but uh, you know, I mean, I think he probably could have developed into someone, um, you know, uh, you know, quite significant. I think that the raw material was there, um, but you know, I think he has some pretty gaping flaws as an intellectual that become apparent uh, as he develops and kind of put him on the pathway to this. Very, very banal reactionary ideology. I mean, like, it's like, and at the, the, you know, that's the thing. Like, Katarina Kolozova said this. She said, like, well, she said, like, what's weird about Land is, like, you know, like, she's like, his racism isn't even, like, you think, she's like, I thought that his racism would be, like, interesting. Like, because I heard about him being racist, and she's like, I thought it would be, like, an interesting racism. Like, it would be, like, you know, like Heidegger or something. I don't know. Like, really I mean, interesting. like, Heidegger has an interesting racism. <laughs> <laughs> it's somewhat interesting. I think it's as interesting as racism could probably be, right? Um, but um, yeah, like, it, like what is like Land just tweeting? Well, He's like, yeah, he, it does relate to. I think it does like to where is Deleuze or Nick Land in Capital in terms of the problem of authority is, you know, with Nick Land and um, Marx. Yeah, are like, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, you can't escape the problem of authority, and then Nick Land puts it in an inevitable Darwinian process, right? In terms of like the inevitability, but if um, you know, it's not taking into account the fact that it's there's no, it's not simply inevitable. There's there actually are forces in history that move things that can be, you know, shifted or changed. Um, so it's yeah, not, so it isn't there's a total inevitable. fatalism. There's yeah. a total fatalism, and so it's not surprising that the CCRU were like writing right after the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Because they're writing in a time where I think it was very hard to conceptualize. Some kind of, but yeah, like so. This is the big problem in capital, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Frederick Jameson says, like, capital is not a political text, right? <clears throat> you know, and you can kind of see this in in this chapter, right? In terms of how Bagley sketched out, like, the notion of opposition is, right? So Marx is like, yeah, well, people are together in the factory, so you know, they do stuff and they organize, and like, it, there's no, you know, and that that's why. I mean, Peter Peter Hallward will say like that. Um, hi, Peter. If you're watching, I'm sure he is. And I just want to, I just want to make it seem like I have all my fans here. Um, but uh, Peter Hall, Hallward uh, will often uh, say things like, "Well, at one point he said the prop, you know, Marx's Capital. You always have to read it uh, plus something else, right? Like, so in other words, like you have mm. Marx's Capital, which kind of functions as this like, um, you know, uh, text that that is relevant as long as let's say capitalism as or the value form maybe." Um, but then on the other hand, there's always a need to update, right, uh, and supplement it with a political analysis that's more relevant to the situation, right? So I, I think that what you get with someone like Nick Land is you, you like, there's a total abs inability to articulate, right, a political solution to that problem. And I think that was, like, really, really true in, in the fatalism. Like, look at Postone, right? 
it's like that was around right after the fall of the Soviet Union too. I mean, that fatalism had already crept in as the Soviet Union system was in terminal decay, but it was like, it reached maybe a, a total natter, right? Like in the early nineties. Um, and then like a few years later, you get like Negri empire and you get these kind of efforts to think like, and I'm not saying that's like a perfect book, but you get these efforts to be like, well, what would it mean, right? To try to create a revolutionary agency today, right? Uh, you know, and people are trying to respond to this question. But I mean, again, land doesn't have that kind of political supplement, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so he goes in the direction of interpreting something like capital as a kind of radical teleology that is just uh, a little bit confused or distracted, right, by these like immature flirtations with or vague flirtations with the idea that there could be some kind of agency that could actually oppose the development of capital, right? But it's very close to like fatalist value form readings. Well, fatalist in the sense like, I would say Postone is fatalist in the sense that like, for Pistone, like Pistone wouldn't say like I'm a fatalist, but Pistone he he throws out like any leftist history or any eminent process where he's like yeah. we just need to have, we just need to have something new, and it's like you know I mean obviously that's not you know that's a consequence of fatalism to think that way. So it's kind of he's kind of like and a, idealism you know, really when it comes right down to it, it's just the fetishizing of the new. Yeah, well, he doesn't really, he doesn't, he doesn't understand, like, you know, he doesn't grasp, and I went over this before, but he doesn't understand the way that, um, among other things, uh, and Postone's like brilliant in his own way, right? But one thing he doesn't grasp is like, how the unfolding of the value form, he doesn't adequately understand the relationship of that to, like the worker struggle, for example, right? Uh, so when you start to realize that, like, in a lot of ways, the worker struggle intensifies the contradictions that are characteristic of capital, capital. Uh, accumulation, right? Because you, you can say like, okay, well, you know, it helps ameliorate the tensions, but in other ways, it intensifies them, right? Um, you know, so that that that's not a simple thing. Um, but I'm just saying that that you know, there's a better way of mapping this kind of analysis of the value form to actual revolutionary agency and revolutionary struggle. And in that respect, there are people like like the group like Theory Communiste who started in '77, uh, right? who were kind of had a value form analysis, but it wasn't like their analysis is more imminent to revolutionary struggle than like Postone's is, for example. Right. So you see, you see debates about that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how land relates to chapter 13, which relates to. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> yeah. Do we have other, do we have other questions here? Someone going to, you got another question? Yeah, we, got? yeah, I could pull up, I could pull up more questions. Let's go. Let's um, let's answer all the. It's one. It's an hour and twenty two minutes. So let's just try to let's try to answer all. Work through all the questions here. See where it gets us. Mm -hmm. And again, to be clear, that the theme of this chapter is cooperation, and it's how uh, the manufacturing era and uh, capitalism uh, require a greater massification of workers uh, in the workplace, um, and the tension that that creates between the individualized status of the worker uh, in the wage labor relationship and their increasing collectivization, um, you know, uh, in their working with constant capital, right? That's the- this, this is kind of an interesting idea. The value form creates- I don't understand. I think creates the state. Does the value form create the state in like a Hegelian sense? <laughs> well, that was, that was like- What that was if like, the opposite? That's, that's like big, what, big, this is a big, what if the opposite were true moment. <laughs> I don't, well yeah because the value form precedes the state right like i mean i i know like you know postone doesn't think this but like son rethel thinks this and i think this um like i don't understand i don't really get how you'd understand like the fact that you have like money in greece in ancient greece in 800 bc if the value form is like something that came along with capitalism or abstract labor or anything i mean marx explicitly says abstract labor and explicitly says it's not you know something that comes from capitalism he says it's retroactively understandable through the prism of capitalism, but he doesn't say it comes from capitalism. That's, those are different things, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an absence of dialectical nuance that leads Postone to declare that abstract labor is a consequence of capitalism. And I think a mistranslation he uses. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you, if you think that, then I think, well, I, I think it's just abundantly clear that the state you know, is created to facilitate certain processes of capital accumulation. Right? Yeah, you know, I, would also, I would also add, even if the state could only come in to place with the value form, it doesn't negate the necessity of overcoming the value form logically. So if we take it as true that the state um, can only come into existence through the value form, that still doesn't necessarily answer the question of um, 
that doesn't sort of answer the question in the affirmative, which is the value form equals good and should not be overcome, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Daniel Jacobs asks, how does abstract labor exist in ancient Greece? Well, you ask yourself what abstract labor is, right? You know, that's the question, right? So it's, it's, it's labor that is, like my understanding of it would be that it's labor that uh, is organized, right? Uh, in such a way, you know, as a calculable, you know, a, a quantitatively organized. Right, that would be the basic definition of it, right? So it's like, I think that you have to ask yourself, well, how can labor become quantita quantitatively organized, right? In other words, how in any localized concept, context um, can you have something like a, a localized as opposed to generalized socially necessary labor time, right? And I think that probably the answer to that lies in tool use, right? Because it's like when you have tools, then you have an equalization of unequal uh, labor powers. And keep in mind that labor power for Marx, people often confuse this. Again, labor power for him, like abstract labor uh, acquires a unique significance under capitalism, but is always like the form giving fire, right? So, so labor power is always there, right? Because that's that's like a property of people. But again, how ontological do we want to get is another question, right? Big debates. But I just want to say like, so obviously in, in a place like ancient Greece, you had like organization of production in a quantitative basis. I'm not saying that was the whole economy, right? You know, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that, that that goes back as that's the organizing principle of civilization itself, right? Um, so again, abstract labor and the contribute, the essentiality of abstract labor to the humans, what we call human civilization, which is itself a kind of economic mode, uh, becomes visible retrospectively more clearly through the prism of capitalism, but it's not as if it emerges with capitalism would be my answer. Yeah. Some deviation. Ender Wigan asks, would you say that Baudrillard's thesis on capital comes from, I assume, comes from a country that is really not really engaged in the production of their material conditions because they outsource their production to colonies. What a great point. I, I feel uh, that a lot of Marxists, um, oh, wait, especially I'm young sorry, Marxists, covering Conrad here. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 sorry, go can, for it. Go for it. Go for it, Ernesto. I, I, like, I was just going <laughs> to comment yeah. that I feel like oh. a lot of young Marxists seem to live in this kind of conditions too. How many American Marxists are just completely alienated from the fact that their commodities around them are made by people? You know, how many people can say that they were made by their own citizens? Yeah, very important. Point. Making making stuff doesn't exist. Capitalism is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. Oh. That's that's clear, and I think also you can say that you can say that the um, like I totally agree with this kind of analysis, and I think also you can say that um, I mean I like kind of like Frederick Jameson on this, where he says like that uh, postmodernism is just like the loss of like pre -mo pre capitalist enclaves from which capitalism could be gauged or like registered as existent, right? Um, so like you know capital becomes so imminent to all processes and value becomes so imminent to all processes. That in postmodernism you have like this loss of like a kind of like nucleus, um, you know, that can experience alienation in that way. So I think at one point he says like in postmodernism we experience alienation as exhilaration, which I think is just a great Jamesonian kind of claim. And I think he's probably I, thinking yeah. of Deleuze here. I, I find it like hashtag relatable, certainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, really, I mean, think of like think of like um, I think a good example of this is like. Uh, and this would be a really good way of looking at the films of like, I have a poster of In the Mood for Love up here, but the films of Wong Kar Wai, or maybe relatedly like Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation, if you've seen it. Sure. Um, but it's about like, um, I mean, it's like, there because there's like a certain kind of alienation in those films, but there's also like an exhilaration at the experience of being alienated itself in the landscape of the modern city, right? And I think the modern city can often be experienced in an exhilaratory way, um, you know, because we're not, you know, it's alien properties uh, become kind of effaced in the context where, well, now we know more people live in cities, finally, right? It's just from a few years mm -hmm. ago than live in the country. Um, its alienating side is, I'm not going to say totally dispensed with, right? Because they're always pre-capitalist enclaves, but that like it becomes experienced more as a condition of life, right? Uh, and there's a kind of like, there's an exhilaration of these kind of flitting signifiers. And I say signifier deliberately, right? Because that's like the big thing of like post-structuralism and um, you know, it's like, how do you get out of this kind of, um, symbolic network? Right. Um, or, or how do you not, how do you, how do you, how do you not get out of it as the case may be, because you can't get out of it because any kind of effort to get out of it would already presuppose a certain, but, but I think to know, 
to know that I think the important point, like from the question is, right, um, what, what, why, to not sort of get caught in the idea that this network is like replace has replaced the means of production. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's that's yeah, it's just that's such a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in terms of yeah, just because it is like Zizek says back back to the Z's, um, and oh boy, does Zizek say it over and over? You could say like the perfect answer to that question is from Zizek, which is the trash, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you have to look at the plumbing of the thing um, in order to understand capital. Um, well, and so this is interesting because like Wong Kar Wai's films, he's from Hong Kong and they often deal with like, you know, Hong Kong is like hyper modernized, right? And they often deal with, deal with you know, urban existence through this exhilarating principle. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at a lot of films in mainland China, they actually treat the, like the movement to the city as like this traumatizing disconnection, right? So in that way, we see that like, you know, the conditions for like alienation in a way, right? The modernist experience of alienation, Frederick Jameson calls it, still exist in China where uh, you know capital hasn't subsumed, let's say, pre-capitalist you know uh, existence to this complete degree, right? Um, so one can still shift from like you know basically a patriarchal. What does Marx say in the Communist Manifesto? Patriarchal, idyllic uh, relations, right? One can shift from an environment defined by that to like a capitalistic urban city and be like you know really really you know traumatized by the tension between those things. But yeah, like again to get back to the point, um, like anything anything that's written about uh like you know the sort of post-marxist in the way where it's like you know yeah marx is like grand narratives or like you know we're beyond manufacturing production or any of that yeah at the very least that has to be like you know um geographically situated which is mm -hmm. also to say temporally situated in terms I, of I, there's, there's kind of an interesting string of things, which is well, I think it goes to this, which is what would overcoming the value form look like? I'm trying to imagine it. It's not impossible. <laughs> just get psychotic. But the <laughs> but the point, but the point is that what we're trying to do, right, is not overcome it for your own like in front of your face. It's like oh, like a uh, Baudrillard, science have replaced the means of production. But you know the commenter made a great point, which is you know because it wasn't in front of his face because he's French. Um, so it's it's not about necessarily overcoming it in a personal sort of like, you could almost say a managerial way, which is, you know, the managers overcome it all the time, you know, like the most, the, le the least, the least psychotic, they're, they're overcoming it personally. They're like, yeah, I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> that's like, that's classic. That's uh, like classic. The highest level of capital is like that. Um, definitely. So yeah, the, the, the idea is we're we're paying fidelity to the fact that that's an incorrect analysis of the whole idea of like a fair and just system, right? Um, so we're like, we're sort of getting out of the realm of psychology and into the realm of uh, the idea. So we're stop, we're, we're ending self-reflection for a second and then we're moving. We, we still are being self-reflected because, you know, we are the systems that we participated in. And you could say the self-reflection is almost done. Um, blocking our sort of view of the fact that when we do talk directly about these subjects, we are talking about ourselves. Um, and that's the Lacanian point, which is your ego identify self is not the full self, right? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a non-dialectical stagnant imaginary picture mm -hmm. um, versus um, the self, which is in fact like Baudrillard word, word you know, Baudrillard self, is not necessarily known by Baudrillard. For instance, he wouldn't have necessarily have the self-reflection to say, oh, I'm French. You know, he didn't quote unquote check his privilege. I, oh, I hate that it's the right answer <laughs> because, you know, Zero Books is so anti radlin But really, in this case, logically, uh, he, he he might be incorrect because he didn't quote unquote check his privilege. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, well what is it Peggy McIntosh who wrote the idea of privilege she like uh yeah she does say i mean these essays are like ridiculous i think i think uh ben pointed out at one point she says like my white privilege involves like the ability to go into like a musical store and like not see any of the musical products that are created by like anyone who is not of my race or like background and it's like one have you ever been into a music store in america uh and like two how the fuck would that be a privilege <laughs> but, um, but um, well, that, that's why the ego is like so important to ignore for a second, because people are like, well, I don't 
it's like you analyze somebody and then the capitalist will say like something well i'm you know or just people in general not just capitalists but especially capitalists with money behind it and with exploitation of workers behind it which is i'm an individual with choice um right but but the fact is that they are not the ultimate describer of themselves and that's sort of like um something that's important to understand or they're not one doesn't sort of define themselves fully you know um there's a self that's sort of beyond their knowledge of themselves yeah, yeah well and also that like also that again this recourse to exhilaration like nick land is like a big fan of like psychotic experiences in fact uh he might have you know uh resorted to them too much which might partly explain the deterioration of his his earlier work um but uh, I think that part of the thing here is like uh, there's no, um, you know, in in like one thing you get in in Deleuze is you don't have like you don't have a uh, like for Deleuze essentially you know deals with reality in an ontological way, right? So uh -huh. for him he he erects like all these distinctions. Um, you know, between like no, nomadic and sedentary and whatever. There's all these different distinctions, right? And they're like good, bad. At some point in his work, they function like good, good bad distinctions, right? So for him, we have to like, you know, uh, you know, reach this, uh, you know, sort of overcoming, right? Of kind of like the tyrannical thinking of totality, right? You know, there's a way that, you know, and, it, and in a way, like, I think he once described Anti-Oedipus as like a self-help book, right? In a way that, you know, like he's working with, you know, the dominant psychological approaches, you know, in his time, right? So like the work of Lacan and so forth, right? Um, mm -hmm. But for him, like Lacan's like petit objet comes, becomes something that's actually constructed by desire. So desire becomes constitutive of the entire Lacanian structure, right? Um, so it's kind of about how you can like follow desire to like, you know, in the, in the form of the schizo to emancipate yourself from these kind of totalizing structures. I know the basic problem with this from a Marxist standpoint would be that like, you know, whatever kind of like personal, um, you know, escape you can find from that or not escape as the case may be uh those totalizing structures will continue to exist because they're part of the structure of material reality right so when jameson says like well we need to have a cognitive mapping right of our existence under capitalism right it's because for him like there's no psychologistic or ontological way of overcoming totality right totality uh you know has you know has its its um basis in kind of the material structures of our era. Right. And so you have to engage, engage with those material structures in order. So again, like a psycho, like psychotic trip might be cool. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, uh, but I'm just saying the ultimate yeah. psychotic trip would be <laughs> abolish the value form. <laughs> oh, example. wow. There it is. The off <laughs> <laughs> The ultimate trip yeah. would just be, you'd be seeing shit on the walls. Like it'd just be like all fucking mental, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're not even wrong in like a proper Lacanian sense. It would be a bit of a, you'd have to push through the psychosis just in the way we do with COVID and, you know, uh, a certain extent, which is the symbolic order when it shifts, you know, people have mental, um, it affects their mental condition. So I think you're, you're correct. There would, I, that would be an interesting transition of what, what would the mental health, you know, the really, to really like count your chickens before you're hatched to like a crazy extent is what will the mental, once we abol abolish the value form, how will we take care of the mental health of the people when their reality is shifted radically? Right? <laughs> really? I think that's an Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a serious issue. Yeah, there's no, uh, uh, I mean, you know, that would be, um, uh, I, I think that would, that would create like a huge trauma, right? In a way. Yeah. Right. You know, and also like the, also the kind of, I'm sure all like, but you know, the trauma, you know, and, and Zizek will often talk about like vertigo, sort of you know representing this but but i think you know the trauma that a big part of the trauma that's existed so far in revolutionary movements is like um you know what zizek describes is kind of like uh the loss of the fantasy itself right um so it's like you know you can survive as long as you like are able to like maintain this sort of fantasy right like okay we're going to complete this then like the revolution will come or whatever right yeah. um but then when you realize that like you know that any such movement um you know, maybe more like, you know, totally unobtainable within the context of your life or any kind of foreseeable timeline that that can afflict a certain trauma as well. Right. Yeah. I imagine um, with technology and the multiplicity of stuff created by, uh, you know, these apparatuses that require a lot of workers, 
um, mm-hmm. that require an authority. Um, you know, the thing that that creates is this multiplicity of sort of products and and um, the demand for the multiplicity of the products or of of creation of of the of the technological output. Yeah. Um, post post value post value form is is is, is an interesting question of of what to what extent um, and this is this is into the realm of psychology but I think it's still it's very key in terms of if we're really going to analyze um, Marx's proposition seriously um, what do you do with this sim- this demand this demand for the multiplicity of products or items you could you know and um, and what what is there to do about that? Um, post or how do, how does how does one maintain it post value form? I think that's really the key question that needs to be answered. Well, but that would be I, that would come that would come down to the cost of reproduction of labor power. Yeah, right. Like so, like I mean, what I want to say is that uh, you know, like and and you know, emancipated from the value form, but I'm I'm trying to distill. But like in in like an environment where you were because you you like this is kind of Marx's point like you still want to have productivity, right? Understood as like the extensive production of use values, yeah. Right. So obviously that's going to be enable that's going to you know involve enabling people, um, you know, to have the conditions necessary to produce use values, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think the point is like if you exist in a, in a society that's not defined by the ownership of capital, right? You're not going to have these like huge discrepancies, right? In terms of you know uh, how much uh, wealth or whatever, the material, the use values that each individual is delegated, right? So, you know, in that context, right, it's like those things, you know, become, they're things that, uh, you know, are delegated to you on account of being a member of society. Yeah. Right. And I'm talking about sort of the second stage of, of uh, communism as it's defined in the Gutha program, for example, which is the closest we'll get to like a more futuristic description that Marx provides. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that basis, because they're not being, um, you know, sold or, you know, to people of disparate levels of wealth, uh, you know, on a consumer market, right? Like they don't function as like fetish objects to the same degree, uh, yeah. you know, that they would in a, in a, in a society that in which the value form held. Right. Yeah. Because the thing is, it's not about the thing, is it? Right. I mean, you, you do. Well, it's about, I would say it's about the multiplicity of things and options. And I, I remember, I, I remember talking with a, a woman who immigrated from the Soviet Union. Her her main critique of the Soviet Union was that it's just so fucking boring there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, which was, and then she came here and she sells hats. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I think I think you shouldn't underestimate that um, the apolitical sort of anti boredom would need to be maintained post value form. There would need yeah, but, to be this multiplicity. But but like you know you could argue that like you know, the, for example, like if we're going off the fragment on machines, that, uh, that the performance of, uh, you know, let's say necessary production by, you know, machining apparatuses, which is already possible, right? There's just, you know, there's a certain structure associated with the reproduction of value and capital that won't permit that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, would liberate people to pursue all kinds of diverse projects, right? So there'd be a kind of like substantive diversity uh, you know, that would actually be able to express itself uh, in that context, yeah. right? And I think that in that way, you know, society could seem a lot less boring, right? Because like, yeah, it's like on one hand, you yeah. don't necessarily have all the, you know, you don't necessarily have the spectacle of like consumerism, um, but uh, spectacle, I'm sounding like, it's like Guy Debord, uh, you know, let's say you have this consumer spectacle, uh, but you do have, um, you do have uh, this tremendous diversification for the potential of how, productivity is expressed right um yeah so i think that would be kind of the the stimulus if that makes sense yeah but people's attention spans would also change i think like and you know bernard siegler obviously uh is, you know he talks about kind of the capture of attention um by uh the exchange abstraction and and techniques right you know yeah. and, and exchange abstraction manifesting in techniques right um i think it's safe to say that i think people's attention spans right now are also extremely conditioned by um, you know, capitalist society and that, but that actually has weird tensions between it. Cause like you have like the internet, which is, you know, kind of a post-industrial thing. Yeah. Right. And then you have like schools that still are largely organized around industrial lines. 
right? So you can argue that like the structure of the internet's actually uh, oppositional to um, the kind of organizations of attention that are you know required for like a more traditional scholastic model. And speaking speaking of attention, all like it matters. All the Facebook comments have dropped off, and all the YouTube comments are still going. Um, mm -hmm. because, and I think that has to do with the platform, um, in terms of you can't get away from the machine that, um, in terms of attention, right? I think YouTube's more conducive to attention with it's, even though it's still YouTube, um, oh, than yeah, Facebook, okay. which is like ADHD structuralized, you know, it's like, um, as like two hours, imagine being on Facebook for two hours looking at something. It's hard to yeah, imagine. By the right. way, I'm not saying that I'm yeah, not saying, no. I'm not <laughs> saying that people people's attention spans will, yeah. will YouTube it's more fathomable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that people's attention spans will slow down. You know, like like you know, I think and that's a real question because we have to ask ourselves a question about like, you know, for obviously like the 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 internet and technology um, you know, they can expedite certain operations and that expedition would exist in any kind of economic context. Right? So there's a serious question here that we have to ask regarding like to what degree you know, uh, this kind of, um, and I don't, you know, I think it's too simple to say people's attention spans have diminished, but let's say this eclecticism of attention that we've, you know, I think are more conducive to today. To what degree is that a consequence of like the particular structuration of technology by capital? Or to what degree is that inherent to like certain digital technologies? I mean, Facebook is actually quite structured in the sense that like, I think they've like, it's like neurocognitively structured, right? So it's like a yeah. kind of reward system where you're, you know, um, yeah, YouTube is made. You, well, you is it true that YouTube was made for this content? Is this like a Hegelian? Like YouTube was made so we could be here today. Uh, talking, Maybe the long, form, the long form, you know, the long form two hour talk. It certainly has become that. I don't think it was made for that initially. I think it was made for a place just to, so someone can upload something, right? You mean you mean in the sense that? Well, I mean, I guess I guess part of the idea is like now like all different kinds of technology support video, whether it's yeah. Snapchat, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram. So like YouTube becomes more of like a long form depository than, or more de more designated in that way than it might've been before. Cause it was really, when it first came out, that was like a big deal. I remember it was like, put videos on the internet. Like that was what, that was what the possibility that YouTube heralded was like just the ability to put videos on the internet, right? And sort of publicly share them, right? But today I think it does function a bit differently. Do we have other questions, by the way? Because we should go. Uh, we should, we've got 17 minutes to two hours. We should go for 20 more minutes and then. Uh... Yeah. Slave labor in ancient Greece. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. No. What's up? No? Fuck. <laughs> this question. God <laughs> damn. It's back. Fuck. Um, <laughs> fuck. Ah, uh, okay. Is it is this abstract labor? Is this abstract labor? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think it is, because I don't think that I think I think like, you know, when Marx talks about the the process of quantification that occurs, uh, he's talking about the process of quantification um, that's connected to the individualization uh, of the the labors, right? Uh, and I think like, you know, um, obviously, you know, Marx's work is contradictory in this respect. Uh, Doug and I, a while ago, Doug and I got like very, very into this question, kind of at the the, the zenith of, of the earlier. Yeah. Uh, we got very, very into this. Um, and I think, I mean, Marx says like you'd buy like a slave in the same way you'd buy like a donkey or something. I mean, I think, I think like if, if I, if I, if I can kind of cheat, and give like a really, really schematic answer to this, I would say the answer is that um, like the, in the relationship of abstract labor, there has to be a quantification process in which um, essentially you're paying somebody for something that is not uh, already in valorized. So there's something that is not valorized that enters anew into the relationship, right? Yeah, um, based on the payment for for wage labor, and I think that um, you know the the for labor power, right? Whereas I think like the thing about what you'd say, and this is too schematic, but like whatever. I think the thing that you would say about slave labor is that like it's already been valorized, 
right? Through this kind of process, right? And then so Doug and I got into like this big discussion of this and I'm trying to, I'm gradually beginning to recall what we were talking about, but it was like, um, the thing is like, partly because of this, uh, slave labor wasn't, you know, I mean, even de Tocqueville comments when he talks about like slave labor in the South, he's like, yeah, it's like really, really inefficient. I mean, it, it functioned, you know, somewhat feudally in the way that in societies that were defined by slave labor uh, or the ownership of slaves, uh, the goal wasn't necessarily um, to rapidly accumulate as much as capital as possible and to like put all your competitors out of business, right? It would have been to, in a lot of cases, it was just to reproduce what was already there, right? So this is this is the relationship, right? Because if you're not if you don't have the relationship of of uh, where you're paying for labor power, you're not valorizing something that's not valorized, right? Um, and essentially, what you're doing is you're taking things that are already valorized and you're just kind of reproducing them. So if we're going to say that, and I think we can say it, if we're going to say that there's abstract labor in ancient Greece, I think what you have to remember is that there were I forget the word for this, but like when slaves uh, were not slaving, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, which already <laughs> is fucking weird, like what I just said. But anyway, when slaves were not slaving, uh, they some of them like actually rented their labor power, right? So like their uh, their their like their labor power is rented to other people, right? And I don't know. I think in some cases they received like a small cut of it, or their owner would, or whatever. And I think that gets closer to assembling the conditions, um, you know, through which uh, something like a kind of has, I want to say proto value form or like the conditions of that can begin to be actualized um, yeah. because it starts to to resemble a kind of general market in which labor power is being abstracted uh, in that way, right? Um, so that would be so that'd be kind of my point is that I wouldn't I wouldn't classify slave labor as part of that, but I do think the distinction is is extraordinarily ambiguous and difficult, right? Uh, in terms of how we make it. Another, I just want to add one other thing. Um, another thing you could say is that, remember, Marx says that if Marx says slaves are constant capital, right, he also says that constant capital can create value under certain conditions, right? Uh, and those conditions involve, like, if you talk about, like, super profits, right, like, if you don't have, like, a general, um, if you don't have, like, the general existence of, like, the same kind of constant capital that's available to everyone, um, you know, uh, and, and there's all like we can actually get into designating the different conditions for this. But the point is, like, we have to ask ourselves, right? Um, if like these places where slaves existed, um, where there may have been cases where people were able to generate value uh, from slavery, because uh, again, like for example, like um, it wouldn't have been the case that uh, everyone had the same, you know, technological conditions or, you know, conditions of the labor process as owners of slaves, right? And then you can kind of get into a weird thing where you're like, well, maybe it wasn't like, even if it wouldn't be abstract labor, right? Uh, which is, it's not variable capital, it's constant capital. Maybe there was still a way to create value in certain formations as a consequence of that. So this is like, this is the fucking hardest question. It's a really hard question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. this is one of those questions I've just went and circled around. <laughs> um, but uh, that's my current, that's my current where I'm at. Like, so I think it's constant capital. I think there's something external. If there's not something external that's not valorized. That's a problem. Can, can you can you expand more on what the valorization of labor means? Valorize. Well, the, yeah, the point here would be like that, like with labor power, like it's something that's not already brought into, um, you know, there's not like it hasn't already been transmitted through the market. Right. Um, so it hasn't a value has a tangible value has, hasn't been assigned to it. Right. Um, so it's actually being introduced externally. Right. To that process. Right. So something prior. Prior to its introduction is valorized. No, it, it would be not valorized. It's valorized in, I mean, in its introduction. Valorized in the production. Okay. It's, it's, it's valorized in its introduction. Yeah. There's a question for you, Elliot. There is. Where is this? What's uh, the question? Uh, let's just wait for it to pop up. Oh, oh, it disappeared. Ender Wigan. How dare you? Yeah. He wanted what? to know if uh -huh. you thought Lacan was a Buddhist. If I thought Lacan was a Buddhist. It's a great question. 
Jesus. I think the categorical <laughs> answer is, I think the categorical answer No, is he wrong. wasn't. He was a Catholic. The end. <laughs> The end. <laughs> I think it's important. I think it's better to stop there because um, I think that I think you can save yourself brain cancer um, in, a, in a very real um, in the Nick Land sense. You can save oh. yourself. Um, he says Hegel is brain cancer. So I, I like to take it and say everything he likes is brain cancer. They, they corrected um, the question. They corrected the question. Oh, OK. 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 So he says, Elliot, do you think Lacan would have would have been a good Buddhist? Lacan would not have been Lacan if he were a Buddhist. Period. Um, let's keep it. Let's keep it real or keep it rational. Is look, um, Lacan would not have been Lacan. There'd be no such thing as Lacan if he were Buddhist. Um, he's he's <laughs> There'd a be no such thing as Lacan. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of he's a Catholic French person. Um, he if he was that's the that's the important that's the important um, sort of aspect of. I think of of rational analysis and of material analysis in terms and um, in terms of understanding how how like in terms of learning from Lacan is, um, you know Lacan is, you know fidelity to desire through demand. Um, it's totally so you can answer that like immediately in terms of the principle of Buddhism. No, he even if it did line up a little bit, but I think he's directly antagonistic, which is this. Caught, you know, Buddhism, you know, desire as the origin of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and then Lacan says it's, he's, he's like the land, he's like what land is to capital. What I think you could make a similar spectrum land okay. and then Marx. Um, you could say Lacan and a Buddhist to a certain extent, <laughs> although I'm sure there are some new agers who try to, but like in terms of, in terms of the elimination of desire, Uh -huh. um, versus fidelity to desire through the demand and how that multiplies, right? Multiplies. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. that's, that's um, what I was about to say is the relationship, the Lacanian relationship to desire seems very different than the, than the yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so in a material sense, Lacan would not have been Lacan if he were born a Buddhist, I don't think. Um, and then secondarily, to what extent are, are his theories, um, Buddhist theories, they're, they're like antagonistic, antithetical, you might even say, to Buddhist theory. Yeah. yeah, very important question, good question, because, you know, I deal with that tension a lot because Buddhism is very popular in psychotherapy um, through mindfulness, um, and I'm constantly arguing against the in the now. It's like, oh, the power of now, uh, focus on focus on the color, what, what else reminds you of that color. I could, give me 30 seconds, I'll hypnotize you with the now and uh, all that with the Buddhist <laughs> bullshit. Um, but uh, no, really, <laughs> um, it, it only takes like 30 yeah. seconds to yeah, hypnotize yeah. someone. Someone's like, I can't be hypnotized. I said, can you give me 30 seconds? Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Lacan, Lacan is not a Buddhist. And, but, it, but that's a very important question in, in the psychotherapy, in, in the clinic, Today, this is why this is a necessary book, you know, and that's I think the impulse. And partly, I'm trying to define all the different ways, and you can see how you can get lost in that. But I mm -hmm. think one of the key, the key core concepts is is capitalism is reproduced through the power of now and through Buddhism and through this sort of individual, you know, nothing can harm me is directly antithetical to justice. I could I would say in terms of to, in the form of rational analysis and um, putting the, the locus of responsibility on the system mm -hmm. rather than the individual sort of psychological relation to the system. Yeah, and see that point about the locus, I think also complements uh, Ender's next comment. He says that he meant it like, both. oh shit, my screen just went off. Uh, that he meant it that both treat the Ego, ego, sorry, as an illusion. As an illusion. I mean, yeah, yeah, they, they do. But like sure. you said, the, the locus of responsibility lies in a different spot for what, how to deal with the ego, right? Also, if we're so, going to go with... Go on. Though, though in a way, it's interesting because like, like, I mean, Buddhism is sort of ontological, right? So it's like, you know, um, and like in, in uh, Zizek's like reading of Lacan, like it gets really ontologized. Right, like that's part of it, right? So like, 
So for like the real, for example, uh, Zizek is like, well, he wants to reject this this Lacanian flirtation with the idea of the real as like the kind of like hardcore of reality, right? And he wants to say like, well, the real is uh, like a necessary something that's necessary necessarily constituted, right, in the development of the human psyche, right? But then the question for Zizek becomes like, well, like then why the fuck would we constitute like this basis of negativity, right? Like you know, why would the human psyche constitute that? And then that gets him into the question of like, you know, well, and he has different answers to this. Like sometimes he goes to science, like quantum physics. Other times he goes to economics. He talks about Son Rethel at one point. But like Zizek, uh, in a way, I think his, his general explanation is that there's a kind of like Schillingian void that's like at the basis of all reality. There's just like this big negative that just like, you know, is manifest in the texture of everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's where you get like Adrian Johnston where he like tries to like read all of science. Like he tries, you know, and he actually, you with like, if you look at like uh, some of the, um, like if you look at um, Miller and I'm trying to think some of the, I know some of the like Lacanian disciples, like if you look at them, like they were already going in this direction in terms of how they looked at science, right? Cause you can see it, I think in like the Italian letter and some other stuff by Lacan. But like, it's like this, like for Johnston, he's like, but the neg like the negativity he wants to make it like he wants to more convincingly than Zizek situate it, it within nature. So he wants to say like there's this negativity, this like aleatory aspect that like is always there in nature. That's there in evolution, right? So we'll read like Stephen Jay Gould that way, or something. Yeah. So it becomes. I mean, for like that's the thing. Like I think Lacan at one point he said like he, he said like uh, 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 un jour vous allez uh, m'intelligiser or something like that. Like one day you will intelligize me. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, I think like um, you see this too, right? With like uh, with kind of like the operation of the Slovenian school is it's like thinking Lacan as like a philosophical structure, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're we're at two hours. Um, and we're yeah, on we Lacan. Covered, we, we should probably stop. Yeah, we we covered a lot. We covered the in terms of capital. We covered the necess the necessity of authority um, to have higher structures, higher quality structures, and we covered a lot of topics. This was a very good talk. Um, I, I, I think this is, this is a very, yeah, this was, this one, this one, this one really hit. <laughs> except, I'm, except I'm angry now because of the thing about abstract, abstract uh, <laughs> slavery. <laughs> and slavery. I'm just angry now. Like I have this angst and I'm going to have to like go drink or something now. Because, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. This is a fun, we could, we could go, go off on this one. Do you think authors today? We'll have a collection of the letters. I think we'll get a collection of their videos and shit posts once we are ontologized or forgotten to history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's uh, yeah. One day we're yeah. One day we'll have to sell the DVD, right? With all our with our combined combined <laughs> sessions, the sagacious world historical capital reading group here. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think I think it. I think you can. You have to. You know, focus on um, the register. The register of Facebook isn't the register of reality. And, mm -hmm. you know, the register of YouTube isn't necessarily the, the ultimate register of reality. So, you know, just like just like it was before, there are authors or, you know, people that are remembered in the way they're remembered. Um, we shouldn't let um, these structures overcome what is substantial to that, to that mm -hmm. extent. Although, you know, maybe. I don't, but I haven't seen anything like that. So maybe in a, maybe 50 years, who knows? <laughs> But certainly not yet. Uh, I think maybe those structures can't sustain um, what's required to have a memory of somebody. So to have a memory of a thinker uh, can't be, um, I don't think it can be platform specific necessarily. To the guys. Mm, well, it's Geist. interesting because Ko Ko Kojiev says that says he, Kojiev was, had a particular uh, tendency to present like the end of history, which I don't know. But, like people say Hegel didn't say, I mean, you know, it depends how you look at it, right? But okay, like he had a particular tendency to present the, let's say a uh, Hegelian end of history or non-Hegelian end of history as resembling like animal existence, right? Um, so when you're talking about like cultural memory, right? It's like, you know, you can kind of, you know, like, even like animals aren't like that, that cow came along, the world was one way and then it was another way, right? Like I'm pretty sure, you know, didn't have like some, uh, they don't have that, right? Um, yeah. So if you go if you go in kind of a Kojivian direction, Kojavian direction, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like you wouldn't necessarily have the without those organizations, you wouldn't necessarily have the basis 
uh, yeah. for that cultural canonization. I think I think you are right, and also like in typical fashion, as soon as I say something, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe I think Zizek would also agree that you know the the the, me the medium matters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not to look for the deeper agalma, you know, structure, the, uh, mm -hmm. the depth. Okay, so why don't we end for the day? It's been, before it's we, been good. Before we end up oh, on yeah, Marshall yeah. McLuhan or something, yeah. Sure. yeah. Before we end up landing on Marshall McLuhan or something, yeah, we should end now. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll end. All right. So long, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. So Thank long, you, guys. Everybody. Yeah. Take it easy. And.